Welcome everyone to another video in our data science course. Today we want to talk about hypothesis testing. So let's start with an example to make, uh, make it clear what we actually want to talk about. Here you have a, a histogram from a normal distribution or from a sample of a normal distribution and you may have an underlying uh, a hunch that the underlying uh, mean parameter, so mu, uh, is equal to 10. So in this case you would look at the picture and think, well, maybe it is right. I mean, the peak of our histogram, so the most common value is close to 10. So it might actually be true that the underlying mean uh, parameter is uh, in fact 10. But of course, we cannot really be sure from a picture. Of course, if the picture would, it be, um, would be shifted away to the left or to the right, I don't know, say it would be centered around 5, then you could probably exclude 10 being a valid um, parameter for the mean. So with hypothesis testing, we can make this more rigorous. Exploratory data analysis, so generating um, um, pictures like these, can help us make conclusions if they are really obvious. So they are, so you cannot discard them, you still need them anyway. But in ca close cases like these where you it could be right, but it could also be way off. Um, hypothesis testing makes things more rigorous, and this is what we want to talk about today. And you might be baffled um, by hypothesis tests if you've seen them before, but in principle, they all, wait, uh, all work the same. And they have a few couple of underlying principles, and then it's only a matter of um, tailoring the test to a specific set of assumptions or whatever you want to test. And this can result in maybe complicated looking formulas, but in the end, they all rely on the same thing. So what does a test start, start with? So at first you need something which is called a test statistic. So something which summarizes our, our sample, because if you have a sample, then, well, you could draw a picture like that because you can comp, uh, comp, um, compress everything into one picture and then you have something tangible. So you took a vector and made a picture out of that. And what a test statistic does, it takes a vector or a sample and makes one specific value out of that. This is what a test statistic does. Depending on what you want to test, this function that takes a vector and gives back a value can look, may, uh, can look quite complicated. But in the end, the statistic is nothing else than uh, a summary of our sample, basically. For instance, you could think of the mean of a vector. So the uh, sample mean is, is a, could be a test statistic. The main thing that qualifies uh, for, a, for a test statistic is that we know the distribution of a test statistic if our hypothesis is really true. So in our previous example, we, know, we already know that it's, it's a normal distribution, what we are looking at there. So that's an assumption that is not part of the hypothesis, it's a general assumption. And our hypothesis is that the mean parameter is equal to 10. And if that were true, then we could think about, okay, what then is the distribution of our, of our sample mean? It should be normal again too, because we know the mean, the sample mean of a normal distribution or of a vector of normal distributions is normally distributed again. So it should be a normal distribution with appropriate parameter. So this is under the so-called null hypothesis. So what we try to test, um, we know what the distribution of our test statistic is. In this case, I, in this example I just gave you, it was the mean. And once we have the distribution of the test statistic, we can compute the probability to see the exact value we see for a specific sample. For instance, if we go back to this sample here, then I could compute uh, the sample mean corresponding to that sample here. Then I would get one value. And because I know the null distribution or the, uh, the distribution of my test statistic under my null hypothesis, I know how uh, probable uh, it would be to see this exact one value I get from my sample. And then if, if the probability is low, we will um, make it a bit more formal in the end. Um, but just the gist of it is if that probability is low, then we re re reject that hypothesis. That's basically it. That's um, 
that's what all tests rely on. It's just a matter of tweaking the test to a specific um, or to a specific um, um, test you want to do. So if you want to test a parameter, then you will have to find a statistic that uses that parameter and so on. One thing um, I want to stress at this point is that we can reject a hypothesis, but we can never accept a hypothesis. We can only say, okay, I have strong evidence against the hypothesis being true. This I can do, I can reject stuff, but in a lot of cases I can simply say, it could be wrong, it could be right, I don't know. Test uh, hypothesis test won't um, give you that certainty. It will only reject um, a lot of um, a lot of stuff that you wouldn't be able to reject from an exploratory data analysis. So let's cover a bit of um, testing lingo. So as I said, a test statistic is nothing but a function. We already covered it. It takes a sample, gives back a value. The null hypothesis um, is always tested against the alternative hypothesis. So we always write H0 or H1. And here in this case, I for, uh, gave you an uh, an example where we tested the mean parameter being equal to a very specific value mu naught in this case. Or in our previous example that was just the value 10. Um, then we also always talk about the null distribution, which is the distribution of the test statistic if I, if I think my null hypothesis is true. So um, yeah, in this case, in the previous example, I was talking about the mean as a test statistic, and we know under the assumption of normal distributions and under the assumption that the true mean is equal to 10, then the, um, the mean statistic will also be distributed like a normal distribution with parameter, ten, per, parameter 10. And what we also always need to know is that, uh, need to um, think about is what probability constitutes as being low? When can I reject my hypothesis and when can I not? And this threshold probability is uh, basically called the significance level and um, is usually denoted by alpha. Um, and then we also have the rejection area. So basically it's the, it's the area for which the probability that my test statistic falls within that area is low, so lower than the, the significance level, so lower than my threshold. So let's um, look at a specific example. Here again, uh, we looked at, um, um, we may look at this statistic here, which is called Z statistic. Um, and under my assumption that I have a normal distribution again here, I know that this statistic is um, normally distributed or standard normally distributed if my null hypothesis is true, so if the real underlying parameter is mu naught. In this case, I know that this statistic is, uh, has a null distribution that is normally, standard normally distributed. Okay, so basically, again, with a sample, I can, if I have a specific sample, so I have like 10 values, I know this is my sample, I can easily compute this and generate a number. And then I can take that value and compare it against the standard normal distribution because I know that is um, the null distribution it is supposed to be if my hypothesis is really true. And for that, I would uh, then again um, compute a rejection area. In this case, I would, if I test against the alternative that it's simply not uh, the specific value, I will take uh, this rejection area where this value here is simply the quantile of a standard normal distribution at level one minus alpha half. So what does this look like? Um, the rejection area is, uh, can be seen here in red. So for instance, if for a specific sample, I compute my test statistic, so this Z statistic I computed for that specific value, uh, that sample, then I uh, get a value of say, I don't know, what is this, one. Say my statistic is equal to one. Then in all of the three cases, for all three uh, significance level, I could not reject the hypothesis because it's not in the rejection area. On the other hand, if the statistics value would be zero, uh, would be two, 
then I would lie in this area here and in these two cases, so for alpha equal to 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, I could reject the hypothesis, but here I couldn't reject the hypothesis. So the lower alpha is, the harder it gets to reject the hypothesis, so I, this is why it's called significance level, I need to be really, really sure that I can, uh, that I have strong evidence against my hypothesis to reject it. That's basically the idea behind this alpha and this is the idea behind this reje rejection area. And in each case you will see, or you can see, that the red area um, sums up or integrates up to alpha. And if you were would think about uh, one-sided rejection area, so if you would uh, do a one-sided test, then your rejection area needs to change too, because then you would only um, reject your hypothesis if you would uh, get strong evidence that the uh, um, that the mean the true mean value goes in the opposite direction than you're testing for. So that's basically the idea. And again, um, the rejection area would then look like this. Notice then that you only test on one side. That's why it's called one-sided test. And I want to introduce something which is called p-values now. And it's something which is a bit notorious, I think, because a lot of things can, um, have been done in the past with p-values that were not like that statistically valid. So this is why um, they don't have a really great reputation. But in any case, I think it's standard theory and we should talk about it. And also they can help a lot. It's just as with all statistics, you cannot really reduce all statistical analysis to one value and then conclude from this one value that whatever you want to conclude. It just doesn't work. And the same is true for p-values, even though it's used quite often, but you still have to think about the uh, context when you get, for instance, a low p-value. So let's first cover what is a low p-value. Um, so that I can introduce it, I need to. Um, I want to stress that there are two different things. So one is the test statistic. It's the um, random quantity, basically. So this is in my statistic that I have in theory. And once I have a specific sample, I can observe that statistic. And usually the random quantity is denoted with capital T and the uh, observed value is denoted with small t. So here I plugged in the specific sample I would have. And again, I, I'm still in the setting of normal distributions um, and under my null hypothesis, the standard normally distributed. And what is the p-value now? Basically, um, it's often colloquially described as the probability to observe um, such an extreme statistic value as you did by your sample. So what do I mean? If you have a one-sided test, it, doesn't, it matters if you look at only the left side or the right side of your, um, of, your, um, of your test. So if you have a left tail test or right tail test, in any case, you will check that how probable is it to see um, the the statistic value under my null hypothesis. So this is the random quantity, this is what I actually observed, and I want to uh, check the probability um, that given my null hypothesis, um, I can actually observe this value. And you can do both things for one-sided tests. Of course, you will have to check where, uh, which direction you want to look at, this is depending on your test. And if you look at a two-sided test, then you will just take the two times the minimum of whatever quantity of these is uh, smaller. So this is the idea of the p-value. So but that's basically the probability to observe such an extreme sample as you did. And if that probability is uh, low, then you can reject your hypothesis. Null hypothesis. That's the idea. If you have a, if usually you say, or not usually, it's um, 
sort of defined like that. If the p-value is less than alpha, your significance level, then you can reject the null hypothesis. And what has happened in the past is that people have been doing so-called p-hacking. So they've been running a bunch of tests until they found an instance where this p-value for whatever reason is less than alpha and then they reject the hypothesis and concluded whatever they wanted to conclude. That's of course not the idea of p-values. You're not supposed to um, test until you get what you want to see. And also the same thing with the significance level alpha. You need to choose before you run the tests um, what significance level you want to test at. If you change it uh, later on, then you again doing you're trying to tweak your results to get what you want to see. That's not the idea of rigorous hypothesis testing. But one thing I want to stress here about the p-value is that even though they are um, they're quite simple to interpret, so if the if the probability is low, then you can reject the hypothesis. The Probability being low doesn't necessarily have to come from your um, hypo hypothesis being wrong. It could also be that your assumptions overall could be wrong. So for instance, right now I've always been talking about a normal sample. It could be just that your sample is not really normally distributed and then the p-value might as well be low as well. And then if you conclude from a low p-value that your hypothesis can be rejected, it's technically true, but it uh, doesn't mean that what you want to conclude afterwards is still true because um, what your underlying assumptions bef before were wrong. So you have to be careful and again, you cannot only base um, your whole statistical analysis on this one p-value or whatever value you want. You need to cover all your bases and you need to check like the assumptions of a test as well. Okay, so... Um, Let's also talk about confidence intervals. So this quantity here, so this here is basically the opposite of the um, probability that the statistic is within the rejection area. So it's basically um, the, pro uh, the probability that we're not in the rejection area. And of course, since the probability to be in the rejection area is less or equal to alpha, the opposite probability is greater or equal to 1 minus alpha. And so this is where you get this part from. And if you now um, rewrite this quantity, so whatever, what is between the parentheses, to, so that the parameter that you're wondering about um, is in the middle, then you have a so-called confidence interval. Then you know that these ran uh, random intervals with a probability of 1 minus alpha or more um, have the true underlying mean parameter within them. So what do I mean by, by that? So the, in, in, not in theory, well, in principle, the mean parameter can only be one value, it needs to be fixed. And what is actually um, changing here with, the sam with different samples is that the interval um, changes. So that's what you see here. So here for different samples, I computed intervals, uh, confidence intervals for the mean parameter. And um, as you can see, in most of the cases, the, uh, the true mean here, it would be three, lies within the interval. In this case, it doesn't. And I think there's another one. Oh no, I think there's only one. The point is the confidence interval it gives you a wide range of uh, possible values where you can uh, where you can assume your parameter to be and the uh, fundamental relationship between hypothesis tests and confidence intervals is basically that if your mu not the one value you're testing for is within the, the confidence interval of uh, that specific significance level um, then you can cannot reject the hypothesis test, the corresponding hypothesis test, and uh, vice versa. That's the idea. So what, what did I mean by the confidence interval with respect to a certain significance level? Well, as you can see here, your confidence interval will depend on alpha. So if you want to be more, uh, more certain, 
that your troop uh, that your parameter lies within the interval then you need to um, make this interval um, wider and this will also change the significance level that's the idea behind this okay so these were quite a few concepts um, with hypothesis tests I hope I managed um, to explain them well at, at first when, to, when you're first introduced to hypothesis testing it feels um, a bit complicated and it's sometimes tricky to explain too so I hope I managed um, um, if not um, feel well we can't really do anything about it but at least um, we can feel better if we look at this dinosaur as I said I wanted to hide the dinosaurs um, in between the slides now and um, yeah for some reason this dinosaur has a really big head I don't know just the way dinosaurs looks coming back to statistics um, as before um, or in the previous examples I've been always talking about um, normal samples and also what I haven't been really stressing is that in all of the in the previous test statistic there was always a par parameter sigma so the true underlying um, variance or standard deviation of the normal sample should have been known by us otherwise we couldn't be, uh, couldn't compute the test statistic and what the t statistic does it remedies that because often you don't even know what the standard uh, deviation is supposed to be you instead use the um, sample standard deviation which is just the root of the sample variance and the question then again is well i have a new statistic what is its null distribution um, if the true mean is mu and with normal samples this is um, simply a so-called t-distribution which is why the statistic is called t-statistic but what happens if we don't have a normal sample because as you can uh, imagine we don't really always have normal samples we might have something else and one way to deal with this is to not try to come up with the null distribution um, in theory but by simulating it and so for instance if we think our sample is a um, is a realization from exponential distribution we can simply simulate a sample that is um, that comes from a from an exponential distribution and then we can in this case I, I simulated one sample and I uh, also computed its corresponding observed statistic of this t statistic and now comes the question okay can I reject my hypothesis now that um, the real underlying mean parameter is equal to mu naught in this case 5 from the code we can see well there's a significant difference between those two so we should probably reject but the point is we still need a null distribution um, to do this and the idea is quite simple we simply do all of this here over and over again and by this approximate the distribution of this t statistic so in each step simply simulate a new sample of the of equal length you will need to keep the length constant and then compute a t-statistic for that um, um, for that sample for that simulated sample and then you can simply um, compute the quantiles of this null distribution and check whether your observed t-statistic from your initial sample lies within this confidence interval so here I visualize the with the histogram. As you can see, this is the histogram based on the t-statistics I've simulated. In red, you see the observed statistic from our original sample. Of course, you would know what our original sample is, but in practice, we often don't. But still, we can always observe the statistic value. And the green lines here indicate where I think 95% of the um, t statistics um, are and so we could say that uh, our observed statistic is outside of that range and therefore we can reject the hypothesis that's the idea of simulation based hypothesis testing in 
So basically, to summarize, you try to simulate the null distribution and then you do all the other steps again. So compare your null distribution to what you observe. Is that probability high? Is it low? If it's low, I can reject. But one crucial thing we did here is that we assumed again that our sample comes from a specific distribution. But again, we don't always know what distribution um, could be reasonable for this kind of sample. So one thing that tries to um, go around this problem is so-called so bootstrapping, which um, once I've explained it, it will sound um, ridiculous that it works, but in fact it's a really um, a valid uh, statistical technique and it works in really a lot of cases. There are instances where it doesn't work, you have to be aware of that. And I've uh, written a couple of instances where it doesn't work in the lecture notes, um, but in principle it works surprisingly often. What is the idea of bootstrapping? Well, we start with an original sample here on the left and then we treat the sample as being representative of our whole population. So we think that, okay, we have a sample here and whatever process the sample came from, if I would take another sample from that, it would look similar to what I've uh, seen now anyway. So the idea now is to create more samples from this one sample by resampling. I've said sample now quite a lot. But the point is, you draw observations from that one original sample with repl replacement. So you uh, draw one value from the observed, uh, from the original sample. Um, yeah, note that down, okay, this is the value three now. Put it back into the sample and then draw again until you have a new sample of the same length as the original sample. And then you repeat that process quite often. So here I have uh, sketched this. It's, uh, I've done it only 10 times here, in practice you do it way more often. So you create new samples from your original distribution, which you don't know, but you think your original sample is representative of it. You create a lot of um, samples, and then you do the same thing again. For each step, compute the statistic, the test statistic, and see what is its null distribution. And that's what you see on the right here. That is basically the idea of bootstrapping. And yeah, again, it's surprising that it works, but it does. In fact, but one thing you have to take into account when you're resampling, then you will have to keep in mind that you want to test under your null hypothesis. You, so you want to be able to assume your null hypothesis is true. So for instance, if I want to test, um, say that my true mean parameter of whatever distribution I have there is equal to five. Then I will have to make sure that I sample from a distribution that has mean five. If my original sample does have mean five, then it will look similar. But if it doesn't, it will change. And therefore you will need to maybe, uh, depending on your test, transform your original sample before you draw the bootstrap samples. So what do I mean by that? Here I have, uh, as I just said, I'm, we're testing for a mean. And here I have transformed the sample. So I wanted to enforce that I'm drawing, assuming that my null hypothesis is true, so that assuming the mean of the sample or the underlying distribution is mu naught. How do I do it? Well, I subtract the mean, the, um, the mean I can compute for any sample, it's no problem computing this, and I add to it my um, theoretical mean I want to test. If you compute the expectation of this, um, then you will see that the expectation is um, you not. So if you think about the sam as a random sample, not a specific sample, then you will see uh, that each, this, um, each realization or each random variable will then have after this transformation will have mean mu not. So if you now draw samples from this, or, uh, from this transformed sample, then you can be certain that you're drawing from samples that correspond to your null hypothesis. And the sampling can be done quite easily with the infer package. It has a rep sample n um, uh, function. And with that, you can will get a tibble, which will um, 
yeah, will look like this. So the first column um, will denote um, which bootstrap sample you have here, and then it's the so this is the first realization of the first bootstrap sample, the second realization of the first bootstrap sample, and so on. So here you would uh, would be able to easily generate these bootstrap samples, and then it's the same thing. Compute for each uh, group here the T statistic, compute the um, quantiles of that distribution, and then compare this value or these quantiles to your initial observed statistic. So again, we get a picture like this, and again, our observed statistic here in red um, lies outside. This, um, this area between the green lines and therefore we can reject the null hypothesis. So that's basically it. That's um, how you do hypothesis testing. What I want to do now is um, to give you um, a short introduction to the infer package so, um, so that you can see how you can use the infer package to easily do this bootstrapping so that you don't have to manually transform uh, these bootstrap samples and so on or the original sample before bootstrapping uh, and then we're done. Um, I know in the lecture notes there are a couple of more statistics um, or more hypothesis tests I covered and I want you to know these but the uh, fundamental principle I have explained now. So let's only cover um, the infer package um, for the technical details in R. So as I said, the infer package is a convenient um, is testing package, especially for bootstrapping, and it's um, part of the tidy models package or the tidy models conglomerate, and is um, basically tidy model uh, tidyverse for testing in this case. So infer is the tidyverse version of testing. And the same as um, a lot of other tidyverse packages, it's uh, concentrated around or it's designed around a few uh, key verbs, so key functions. In this case, it's specify, hypothesize, generate, and calculate, which um, one determine the variables of interest. Second, um, hypothesis the or state the null hypothesis. Third, generate the samples, the bootstrap samples, if you actually want to do um, simulation-based simulation testing. And then calculate the test statistic for either your original sample or um, calculate the null distribution for, for, so calculate the test statistic for all your bootstrap samples. And with that, you have computed the null distribution. So how does this work? It's a pretty straightforward um, workflow. So you start out with a table, which contains your original sample, and then you specify what you want to test. In this case, my response variable, so what I want to test is the origi is original, so what I have in my table here. Of course, if I have a table with a lot of different variables, this is where it makes more sense to specify the response, because here I have only one variable. But still, the syntax is always the same. Notice that the output is again the original tibble, but here you have a line that indicates what the response variable is, so that tibble now knows uh, what the variable of interest is. And um, next, you hypothesis what uh, what the hypothesize what the null hypothesis is. So you say the null is in this case point, so you want to test whether a specific parameter is equal to a different value. So in this case, I want to test the mean mu against is being equal to mu naught. Again, the result is a tibble, but now this tibble also knows the null hypothesis now. These are all internal objects, uh, the remaining functions of infer can work with. So this is why I always say this tibble now knows the stuff. Yeah. Now, if you immediately calculate or use the calculate, you will have to specify what statistic you want to compute, in our case, for instance, the t-statistic. Then you will simply compute the observed statistic for this original sample. And similarly, if you put a generate step between hypothesis, hypothesize and calculate, then you will generate bootstrap samples, and the calculate step will then compute the statistic for each bootstrap sample. <laughs> 
So here you have to use Bootstrap to generate new samples and then you get the t-statistics value for each uh, bootstrap sample and then you can easily visualize it with the appropriate infer functions. Um, this will also show the observed statistic or you could get the p-value. So in this case the p-value is 0 0.03 so we would reject the uh, null hypothesis um, when we would um, use a significance level of 0.05. And that's basically how the infer package works. So now let's cover uh, another small technicality with a two sample test. So in the lecture notes, I was looking at the difference of heights between men and women. And here we want to test the, um, the mean height of men against the mean height of women and the null hypothesis say well the means are actually the same versus the alternative it's, they are different and there's the difference of means test statistic which does uh, which looks like this here and the idea for how you can then use the infer package is to hypothesize that your so you have to specify that your height depends on the gender, which is used via this tilde, which is called a formula in R. And then you hypothesize that this here is actually equal to the label being or the height being independent of the group label, so independent of the gender. This is what the null hypothesis then is here, and what hypo um, the generate step that then does is not it simply draws bootstrap samples um, arbitrarily, but it simply permutes the labels. So the idea behind that is if the null hypothesis is true, then the sample means are the same anyway. So it doesn't matter if I generate uh, or if I look at, if I compute initial, how do I want to say it? If the means are the same, it doesn't matter if I throw all of my two samples together, so to have one large sample and then draw from that two new samples. One for the man, one for the woman. This time I do it without replacement, so I don't generate, um, I cannot get multiple values. And the point is, if I, um, if the null hypothesis is really true, the men and women are the same in height in, uh, in this particular case, then it doesn't matter that I have now rearranged the group labels. So, the, so some heights that originally corresponded to men might now correspond to women. But again, if the null hypothesis is true, it shouldn't change much. And this is the idea behind this permutation step. And then the calculate step for your new samples computes the t-statistic again and yeah that's uh, basically it then you do um, then you compare it with the specific quantiles again and then you're done all right i think that's all i wanted to cover so this is it was again a short summary of what we covered in the lecture notes of course i know that i covered more steps or more hypothesis tests in the lecture notes and I expect you to know them but the yeah. fundamental underlying what if, that's like two words for one so the fundamental uh, principle of hypothesis testing I hope I explained now and um, you understood that and yeah with that I can conclude my summary so see you in the next video bye